I think it was the second video lecture I made for my YouTube channel uh, back in 2015 um, that focused on Freud's dream theory. Um, I've had some requests recently to do a lecture on dreams, and uh, I had a vague memory of having already done so, so I went back and sure enough there it was. So uh, I'm going to make some preliminary remarks now uh, to cover material that I didn't touch on in that video, and then I'm going to follow these remarks with uh, that video again, which I will repost. Uh, together with these remarks. Um, okay, um, I guess I've come to have a deeper appreciation for Freud's dream theory in the years since I made that first video, um, which really just uh, kind of tried to summarize um, some of the main essentials of, of Freud's theory. When I say I've come to have a deeper appreciation, um, I don't mean that I ever devalued uh, uh, dream theory, either theoretically or clinically. Um, when I finally weaned myself from note-taking, a terrible habit that one gets into when one is a candidate because one is required to keep process notes in order to be able to report material in detail in continuous case seminars to one's colleagues and teachers, and then you develop this terrible habit. And I discovered that uh, my clipboard was a shield between me and my patient. The patient made it to the clipboard and then only indirectly to me. I was shielding myself. And of course, in these notes, the really important uh, stuff never gets into the notes because uh, at that point, when the analyst wants to engage and sits forward, he puts down his notepad and uh, begins to talk to the patient, and that never makes it or seldom makes it into the process notes. Uh, largely, it's a useless uh, exercise. Nowadays, I think um, candidates are required to keep detailed notes on one of the four sessions with the patient each week so that they have some detailed material to present. Um, but it, it left me with this bad habit. Uh, after a while, uh, I finally got rid of the clipboard, but not entirely. Um, I would pick it up when the patient came with a dream, and I would note down the dream, and then I would note down uh, the patient's associations. Um, in, in, in a paper uh, that he published, uh, I think, more than two decades after he published The Interpretation of Dreams, uh, which was published in 1900. I think this paper was published somewhere in the 1920s. And the paper summarized uh, some points, rather practical points, about how to work with dreams in the clinical situation uh, that Freud had originally just presented to a number of colleagues and then subsequently wrote down and and published in this paper. Um, he talks about the classical method of dream interpretation, uh, which is uh, once the patient has stated the dream, the analyst uh, takes the dream uh, scene by scene, as it were, starting at the beginning and then moving on to the next scene and then the next one, asking the patient to associate to each of these scenes. And when the associations are, are, are collected on scene one of the dream, then the analyst says, okay, so what about now this happened? What, what, what comes to mind about that? And then uh, she appeared in the dream. And what do you think about her? Who is she? What, what, what are your feelings about, about her? Uh, and then scene four and five and so on. Uh, Freud said that uh, this is the best method for working with dreams, with one's own dreams. And I see that, but I also prefer this method when working with patients' dreams. So I become pretty active. Uh, after the patient has stated the dream, I say, okay, let's take it from the top. Tell me the dream again. And then I pause after I get the first scene. So what are, what are your thoughts about that? Okay, now scene two. What are your thoughts about that? 
and in this way we gather the associations. Um, Freud says one doesn't have to work this way. Freud refuses to say which of the five methods he outlines is the best. Another method is to take the most vivid element of the dream and, and, and uh, start the associations there. Um, another method is to not focus the patient at all, just see what the patient does with the dream. Um, uh, or one can pounce on some language that appears in the dream, some statement that appears in the dream. So there's all kinds of ways of starting. Um, but I prefer the classical method, and I get busy. I kind of roll up my sleeves when the patient brings um, a good dream. Um, uh, okay. Uh, one also uh, asks about what is the affect in the dream? Was it a frightening dream, a pleasant dream, an erotic dream? Uh, was it a nightmare? One wants to know what the affect is. In the dream, uh, one often asks, uh, what do you think triggered this dream? Something, Freud calls this the day residue, something from the day before, the night before, that you can see may have come into this dream. Uh, that's worth asking about as well. So one gathers associations. Um, okay. Uh, a, rec a paper was written sometime in the 1940s, I think, by Richard Sturba, called Dreams and Acting Out. And uh, the main point of that paper is to say that we shouldn't get overly focused on the manifest content of the dream itself, Freud recommends an attitude of freely hovering attention on the part of the analyst. And so our attention should hover over what comes before the dream is reported, what comes after the dream is reported. Um, and Sturba gives a number of really interesting uh, illustrations where uh, the patient engages in some kind of acting out. Uh, now more likely to be called an enactment. And having done this enactment, the patient goes on to report a dream. And sometimes it turns out that, that this enactment is almost a free association to the dream before the dream is reported. Uh, and sometimes the acting out can come after the dream and be a kind of association or appear to be a kind of an association to the dream. I think Sturba also says that uh, it might be better to say that both the acting out and the dream come from the same place. That is, they both reflect um, the same internal conflict, the same internal dynamic issues. I think nowadays I would prefer to say that Maybe they both come from the same unconscious fantasy. The unconscious fantasy, which Kleinian spell with a PH, unconscious fantasy, has generated both the acting out and the dream. Sturba gives the example of a patient who uh, always comes wearing his glasses, uh, but on this day he arrives without his glasses, he realized he'd left home without them halfway to the analyst's office and he didn't want to take the time of going back and getting them, so he comes without the glasses. Okay, there's a bit of an enactment. That's an uncharacteristic behavior. He then presents a dream in which uh, he was about to get into a fist fight with some man and uh, I guess Back in the day, the habit before you got into a fist fight in preparation was to remove your glasses. Okay, we're going to fight. I'm taking my glasses off because I don't want to get punched in the face and have my glasses break and have some glass wind up in my eyes. Um, so in light of that dream, it appears that unconsciously the patient was coming, unconsciously expecting to get into something of a fight with the analyst, so he had removed his glasses in advance. Okay, 
the acting out serves as a kind of an association that reveals the meaning of the dream. Uh, Sturba went on to give a number of other really illuminating uh, illustrations of this. Uh, so, in a way, we, we can say that we should be listening to the whole session as a dream. Uh, the way the patient enters the office, uh, the way the patient leaves the office, these kinds of enactments. So we're not just listening for the dream, because the dream is not just the dream. The dream is uh, all of this behavior put together. That's really listening with freely hovering attention. And this point has wider significance um, in that it kind of, uh, it kind of implies that um, much of the time we're walking around in a dream. Um, that patient who left home without his glasses was not consciously thinking, I better remove my glasses because I'm going to get into a fight with my analyst. It was all unconscious. How much of our behavior is exactly this? How much of the time, without knowing it, are we living out an unconscious fantasy? I think a great deal of our behavior uh, is, in fact, the living out of unconscious fantasy. Uh, and therefore, the goal of psychoanalysis is to acquaint us with our unconscious fantasy so that we can begin to distinguish fantasy from reality. And uh, analytic work on, on literal dreams is an important part of this. Um, other writers, Otto Fenichel, for example, uh, point out how sometimes dreams um, represent uh, lost memories, memories from early childhood. And sometimes the dream represents something not remembered, but something that happened that was not processed, either by the primary process or by the secondary process. Some early experience, pre-verbal, uh, it can't be remembered, uh, but the patient's behavior, not just the patient's dreams, but the patient's behavior in life, um, leads us to suspect that something must have happened early on that might be repre being represented and, and affecting the patient's life here and now. My colleague, uh, Joseph Fernando, writes about what he calls zero process. This early pre-verbal experience did not get processed, either primary or secondary process. It got zero process. So what do we do with this? Uh, the patient and the analyst together uh, f create a construction. Uh, they co-construct a narrative about what plausibly might have happened or must have happened uh, to give rise to this patterned behavior. So I have a very good example of this. A patient came to me for severe claustrophobia, um, energetic engineer, scientist, very determined to solve all problems, um, but reacted badly to being in a traffic jam, road rage. If he was on a, an airplane that wasn't allowed to take off, he was afraid he was going to be carted off the plane in handcuffs because he couldn't contain himself, his rage. Um, I had a great difficulty getting him to commit uh, to coming to see me uh, at sufficient frequency. I knew that his mother was a lifelong hysteric, but I realized at a certain point that I didn't have any idea about what the early, earliest uh, situation was 
between him and his mother, but he had an eight-year-old sister, so I instructed him to interview her. She remembered coming home at lunchtime, the mother's bedroom still darkened, mother in bed asleep, the room stinky, smelly, the baby in the crib under the dormer, and when she looked at the baby, it was unmoving, wide awake, not wiggling, not crying, and then she saw the straps. The baby was strapped down in the crib. Um, this man has been fighting what seemed to be straps. I was trying to strap him to my couch three times a week. Uh, he had to go to hospital, and he was in a hospital bed in the corridor, and they had to pull up the, uh, the rack that they used to, at the side of the bed to prevent patients from falling out, and suddenly he reacted as, as if he was, well, the way we made sense of it in terms of our construction, he was back in the crib looking through bars again, um, this man's whole life has been fighting being strapped down uh, in a rather manic and extreme way. So we came to understand his life in these terms. So that's a, a construction of a kind of unconscious fantasy that he is being restrained, blocked, strapped down. And he's fighting this. That seems to be the prime uh, element in his overall attitude towards life, the need to break out, break through the straps. Uh, okay, unconscious fantasy is moving us. Um, so we want to look at the whole session as a dream. Um, we want to look at a patient's whole... Uh, repetitive, characteristic way of, of living his life or his characteristic way of being in a relationship with someone else. Um, there's a dream. There's a narrative. There's a fantasy that um, is behind this repetitive, patterned behavior. Freud called all of this, the rep repetition compulsion, the compulsion to repeat, uh, because the patient is locked into a particular narrative, a particular story, a particular belief system, uh, an unconscious fantasy that he's living out repetitively. And of course, the aim is to wake him up, to help him wake up out of this dream that he's living. Um, we often think of, of that it's only psychotic patients who are so captured by a dream um, and that they are delusional and hallucinating. But um, we are all closer to the psychotic than we ever thought. I mean, Leonard Shengold clarified that back in the 90s when he wrote a book called uh, delusions of everyday life. People thought delusions belong to the psychotics experience, but of course, Shen Gould recognized that everyone is delusional to a degree, at times, some people much more than others, but in a sense, we're all delusional. In a, in a sense, we are all to a degree psychotic in that we have lost touch with reality we're screening reality through the screen of our fantasies, and we don't even know we're doing this. We don't even know that these are fantasies that we are mistaking for reality in, and that we are unconsciously manipulating reality so that it fits our fantasy. Um, people do this in their relationships all the time. A man has a particular view of what women are like and uh, he finds confirmation. Um, he maneuvers women to confirm his fantasy of what women are like. I recall the patient who came to me in his 40s after his third wife cheated on him and left him. Um, it soon became pretty clear, as he had begun to suspect, that maybe he played some role in this. It wasn't just bad luck. So then he had to go to Europe for two weeks on business. And before he 
goes, he calls his best buddy and says, uh, you know, Jane gets a bit lonely when I'm away. Uh, it would be really nice if you would maybe drop over and take her out for a meal or a movie. And when he comes back from Europe, of course, Jane has moved in with his buddy. And uh, okay, he set it all up unconsciously to conform to his narrative of the infidelity of women. Uh, he began to wake up to the fact that he was trapped in this narrative and um, subtly, and maybe not so subtly, uh, arranging for it to come true over and over again. Okay, uh, to a far greater extent than we know, we are walking around in a dream. Uh, uh, Freud and Bion had rather different attitudes towards the dream. For Freud, the dream was something to be interpreted. The content was to be understood. It was to be decoded. We get to work. We roll up our sleeves. We try to understand the deeper meaning of the dream. Uh, Bion uh, seemed to be simply delighted that we are dreaming. Uh, thank goodness. You're having a dream. That's much more important than interpreting it. Uh, I'm not suggesting Bion was against interpreting dreams. He was just very thankful that dreaming was going on because to, to, to Bion, the psychotic doesn't dream. Uh, well, it doesn't seem that he dreams he, he, because he doesn't know he's dreaming. I mean, when we call something a dream, that's because we think we know that that's just a dream. That is not reality. That's just a dream. The psychotic can't make that distinction. Uh, so he takes his dream to be reality, and he doesn't have dreams. If he comes to you and says, I had a dream last night, you know he's getting well, because now he's distinguishing the dream from the reality. Uh, big step forward. Uh, I share both Freud, Freud's and Beyond's attitude here. I think it is just good to dream. It's even better to know that your dream is a dream, even better to being able to interpret the narrative and understand uh, the unconscious, the latent thoughts behind the manifest dream. Okay. So I'll now uh, turn to the earlier review of the basic elements of Freud's dream theory. Dream theory. Um, early on, Freud distinguishes between two different kinds of mental functioning or mentation um, in the unconscious, uh, primary process, uh, in the conscious ego, secondary uh, process thinking. Secondary process thinking is the logical reality oriented thinking of everyday life. Something can't be both A and non-A. It operates according to the uh, principle of Aristotelian logic, the principle of non-contradiction. But Freud discovers that in the unconscious there's this very different type of mentation that he called primary process where a uh, uh, contradictions can exist side by side. I can be here and there, I can be a man and a woman, I can be alive and dead. Um, so the principle of, of non-contradiction does not apply in the primary process. And the mechanisms that govern this primary process thinking um, are also, uh, which, which actually constitute the laws of the unconscious mind, that Freud discovers, um, uh, these are also the five um, components of what Freud called the dream work, the mechanisms that lead to the formation of dreams. But first of all, um, it's important to note that in his early work, I mean, the interpretation of dreams was written in 1900, um, in his early work, Freud describes the unconscious as lawful. He discovers the laws that govern it. Condensation, displacement, plastic representation, symbolism, 
secondary revision are the five components of the dream work and the five laws of the unconscious mind. So the unconscious mind ha is lawful, it's orderly, and uh, therefore you can imagine an artist wanting to dip into it in order to pull out some kind of creative organization or pre creative principle. Freud really changes his attitude towards the unconscious. Um, by 1923, instead of describing it as ordered by these lawful mechanisms, he describes it as a chaos, a cauldron of seething excitations. A cauldron of seething excitations. A cauldron connotes that thing that witches throw frogs into and stir. Um, seething snakes, animals, uh, insects, seething. So the unconscious is this chaotic, threatening, seething witch's brew in 1923. I mean, the young Freud felt that society was too repressive. He wanted it to loosen up, especially with re regard to sexuality. The older Freud seeing the unconscious as a witch's brew is becoming uh, is developing a conservative a attitude uh, towards we need the social law, we need the superego uh, to restrain and keep at bay the chaotic forces of the unconscious which he now is associating with barbarism. He's now talking about the thin veneer of civilization beneath which barbaric drives of sex and aggression exist. Um, I guess it's not that uncommon for young men to be radical and older men to be conservative, but that certainly applies to, to Freud. But in the process, you know, he changes his understanding of the unconscious mind from, from an orderly, creative thing to a chaotic thing. Uh, there's not enough in the psychoanalytic literature that has drawn attention to this major shift in Freud's attitude towards the unconscious mind. Um, okay, but let's go back and look at the laws of the unconscious then. Uh, first of all, condensation. Uh, condensation I affects disguise uh, by substitution. But you substitute one thing for another on the basis of something that they have in common, a principle of similarity. The Russian linguist uh, Roman Jakobson and following him Jacques Lacan uh, understood that Freud, in talking about condensation, he's really just talking about metaphor, because that is what metaphor is. It is substitution based on a principle of similarity. So let's see how this works in dreams. All you can remember from your dream is that you seem to be spending hours in a shoe store uh, trying on one pair of shoes after another, you, foot, you, you slip your foot into this shoe, and then you slip it out, and then you slip it into another shoe, and all night long it's this in out. The foot is analogous, similar to the penis. The shoe is analogous to a vagina. It doesn't look like it has anything to do with sexual intercourse, but it's the old in out all night long. Substitution has affected disguise on the basis of metaphor. That's condensation. The second mechanism is displacement. Here also disguise is affected by substitution, but the substitution is not on the basis of a similarity, but on the basis of contiguity. Not things that resemble each other, but things that go together. So A, B, C, D, E go together. They don't resemble. One, two, three, four, five go together, but they don't resemble. So in your dream, all you remember is the smell of bacon pervading the house and the sizzling of the bacon on the stove. And you recount the dream, and I ask you for your associations, and you go from bacon to eggs, and then it hits you, oh my God, maybe my egg is fertilized, the condom, condom broke. On the surface, it doesn't look like the dream has anything to do with fears of pregnancy, but you went from bacon to eggs. Bacon doesn't resemble eggs. Eggs don't resemble bacon, but they are contiguous. They go together, and disguise has been achieved on that basis. The third mechanism, plastic representation, simply means that the dream relies on a kind of picture language. 
uh, actually Chinese contains pictographs, little pictures, as did um, Egyptian hieroglyphics. But the, 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 the dream simply works in this uh, communication through a kind of picture language. Um, the fourth element uh, is symbolism. And here is where, in my opinion, Freud gets into trouble. Um, people think that Jung had a concept of a collective unconscious and that Freud didn't. That's false. Freud, like Jung, did have a concept of a collective unconscious. Um, and um, both Jung and Freud believed that when patients are not producing personal associations to their dreams, the analyst steps in with his knowledge of universal symbolism. For the, for the Jungians, this is the universal knowledge of, 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 of symbolism contained in world mythology. Uh, for Freud, the analyst steps in with his knowledge of this kind of universal symbolic language of the mind. Um, uh, I think this is chapter 10 in Freud's introductory lectures devoted to symbolism. In all times, all places, all historical periods, knives, daggers, umbrellas, uh, have a phallic significance, bags, containers, uh, have a, uh, signify the vagina or the womb. Um, uh, running up or running down stairs, bang, 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 bang. Somebody's getting banged. This is intercourse. Uh, snakes are going to have a phallic significance. Okay, Freud was very much under the influence of Wilhelm Steckel, who loved these automatic equations, as do these crappy books you can buy at the world's biggest bookstore, A Thousand and One Dreams Interpreted, you dreamt of a tower, you look in the index, T, T, tower, tower, ah, oh, that's what it means. Uh, this, of course, is utter nonsense, um, but Freud fell for it to a certain degree, and in doing so, he departs from his overall method. There's a wonderful essay by the literary critic Kenneth Burke, written back in the 1930s, called Freud and the Analysis of Poetry. And Burke distinguishes two different kinds of literary interpretation, essentializing and contextualizing. And he says that Freud's overall method is a contextualizing method. Freudians don't know what dreams mean. We simply have a method of putting the dream in the context of the patient's own personal associations to the dream. So the analyst is writing the dream down as it's told, and then he asks the patient to associate, and the patient maybe skips something. Well, what about the taxi? Uh, and then just before the glass shattered, there was a, you said there was a little dog. What comes to mind about the little dog? The analyst is just asking questions to draw the patient out. But why? Because the mind is an association system. The mind is a system of, of associated elements, and the analyst is simply inviting associations. And the meaning of the dream sometimes emerges through these personal associations. Freud says sometimes the patient doesn't have any personal associations, so that's where I have to step in with my knowledge of the universal symbolism. And this is where Freud and Jung fall into what Burke calls essentializing, as opposed to contextualizing. And I think it's a mistake. Uh, take a snake, for example. Sure, a snake could stand for a penis, but uh, what if it's a, a boa constrictor uh, that uh, smothers you? Take away the S, you got mother. Uh, there may be no phallic significance to that snake at all. It may be about some encircling, squeezing, engulfing kind of thing that, um, uh, or, or it may swallow you whole. Um, also, there's the snake that, what is it, the Asclepius, Asclepius the medical symbol of healing? Caduceus. The Caduceus, Caduceus, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, we, we, so, so, a number of years ago, CBC producer Erica Ritter wanted to do a little series on dreams, and she had Dan Capon, who uh, was a Jungian analyst, 
she had him in the previous week to talk about the Jungian approach to dreams, and she clearly found him much more satisfactory than she found me, because I just refused. I, I don't know what these things mean. So she gave me an example of a, of, of a ship, sharp prow, plowing through the water. Surely that must be phallic, she says, you know, plowing through the water, la mer, the mother, mother's getting plowed by this sharp uh, I said, I don't know what it means. The patient's associations might go to the fact that it's a container ship. And the patient might be wondering whether there's anything in the hold or not. So then she gives me another example. Um, a red fire engine streaking through narrow streets. Um, uh, bell clanging. Um, smoke. Uh, uh, surely this red thing streaking through narrow streets with an erectable ladder, uh, surely this is a sexual dream. And I said, I, I don't know what it means. I asked the patient, maybe the patient associates to uh, help. Uh, the house of myself is burning down. Uh, or, or maybe this is a person who feels in need of rescue every time she gets hot. I don't know. Who knows? We'll find out uh, through the uh, associations that the dream has. So I think Freud opens in this one element. Uh, he opens the door to analyst authoritarianism and departs from the otherwise much more democratic and humble uh, technique of simply uh, realizing that the patient is the only expert uh, on the patient's psyche. Um, Okay, so that's the fourth. And then the fifth element is secondary revision. So I always say, imagine uh, a, a lumber, a factory. What, it, what, 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 what do you call those factories where the logs go in and, uh, and at the end the timber comes out? Um, uh, a sawmill. A sawmill, a sawmill. So the raw trees are going in at this end and the nice lumber boards are coming out at the other end. And think of these five things happening in between. First, the raw material is condensed, and then it's displaced, and then it's plastically represented, and then it's symbolized. And the fifth and final element is what Freud calls secondary revision. The message, the latent content, uh, has been all chopped up and disarranged because the latent message that generates the dream in the first place is unacceptable. It, it causes too much anxiety or guilt. I have death wishes towards my mother. This is unacceptable. I would wake up if that came, became conscious. Um, the purpose of, of, of dreams is to allow sleep to continue, Freud says. Uh, and so it allows sleep together to, to continue by cloaking this message in such a way that it passes through the censorship and the alarms don't go off and I'm able to go on sleeping and I have a manifest dream, which is a disguised dream, disguised through all of these mechanisms. So the latent message has been chopped up, and now at the end it's given a certain order, but it's a false order. Uh, and I look at the dream, and I think I know what it means, because the secondary revision, the false ordering of the distorted pieces, has thrown me off. I don't ask any further questions. So, for example, um, I'm staying at a friend's in the countryside and I come down in the morning and I said, I, and last night I dreamt about a dream, I had a dream, I was on a train all night long. And, and he says, oh, well, you just heard the 222. It comes through at 22 minutes after two every night, blows its whistle. That's, ah, that must be why. So, um, how are the Jays doing? Uh, we, we don't ask any further questions. We've identified the trigger of the dream. We've identified what Freud calls the day residue, something from the night before, the day before, that has triggered the dream. Uh, but this is simply tracing the cause of a dream, which psychoanalysis is not about. So that people show up on CBC reviewing the latest, uh, being interviewed about the latest research from dream labs. And the, you know, REM states. Um, and this is completely irrelevant. And yet these <laughs> these arrogant, arrogant characters think that Freud's outmoded dream theory is 
you know, in the garbage. It's some 19th century, you know, and they go on to talk about the dream physiology, uh, the brain physiology of dreaming, which is completely irrelevant. Because psychoanalysis is not about the cause of dreams. The cause of my dream might have been the 222. It might have been the pizza I had before bed. Psychoanalysis is about the meaning of dreams, not about the cause of dreams. So, all right, the, the, the train whistle in the distance meant that I was having a dream about being on a train. But now ask me about the rest of the dream. Well, there was a murder on the train. Well, who got murdered? Well, it was this lady. Well, what did she did she re, did she know her? Did she remember or resemble anyone? What are your thoughts about the the woman who got murdered? Um, there was something about her glasses, these horn rim. Oh, my mother just got new horn rim glasses. Well, now we know it's mother who got murdered on the train, and we're moving on towards getting at the real uh, interpretation of of the dream. Okay, secondary revision, the false order that throws us off. If you trace the dream only to the trigger from the day before, the day residue, you've only done a pre-conscious level of interpretation. You have not gotten to the unconscious. What are dreams? Uh, disguised, attempted disguised wish fulfillments. Um, wh why do we, if dreams are wish fulfillments, how come we have nightmares? Who could wish to be having that kind of torture and anxiety all night long? Freud gives two answers. He adds the word attempted. Attempted disguised hallucinatory wish fulfillments. Sometimes the attempt breaks down. The disguise is too thin. In which case, it's an anxiety dream and you wake up sweating. The dream has failed. You've awakened. One explanation. The second explanation is, if you dream of being, say, chased all night by the hell's angels who are going to do something terrible to you if they catch you, this is gratifying a superego wish. Dreams are wish fulfillments, but the wishes don't always come from the id. The wish can come from the superego. And a superego wish is a wish for torture, a wish for pain, a guilt-motivated wish for punishment. And the dream gratifies that by giving you a punishing dream. Okay. Uh, attempted disguised hallucinatory wish fulfillments. Remember, dreams are hallucinations. Psychotics don't dream. Well, that's because all they do is dream. They've lost the distinction. And if a psychotic patient says, I had a dream, you know he's getting better. Because in saying, I had a dream, he's making a boundary between reality and dream. He's regaining the boundary. So we're all of us psychotic at night. And Freud gives us this way of understanding what's going on, which we can now apply not only to dreams, but we can apply to slips, and we can apply to the content of the psychoanalytic session, because like a dream, I mean, that is the correct way of psychoanalytic listening, to listen to everything as a dream, to listen to everything as a manifest content that disguises a latent content. This is called listening with the third ear, an attempt to get behind the manifest back to the latent using the person's own associations, not our presumed understanding of what equals what. Okay. So that's a little thing about dream theory and how it's relevant to clinical work.